that there was no God. It was really not a, a, a subject of conversation. So my, my uh, rather strident criticism of religion is really a product of, of very recent events. I mean, in my case, it's September 11th, 2001. So it's, my, my upbringing isn't so uh, informative of, of my views at the moment. Well, it was two things. One, just the, uh, the rather obvious liability of religious certainty was, was made um, extraordinarily uh, clear uh, on that day. I mean, we were having people flying planes into our buildings for explicitly religious reasons. Um, but was, what was also made clear is that we were going to deny the religious rationale uh, because of our own attachment to our own religious myths. I mean, the only language we could find as a culture to comfort ourselves was to endorse our own God talk. Uh, so I, I, I suddenly saw faith playing both sides of the board in a, in a very dangerous game, where we as a nation uh, in uh, prosecuting our war on terror, which was obviously a necessary thing to do, though calling it a war on terror I think is rather silly. Uh, but we'd, we'd, we were... Uh, consoling ourselves with our own religious certainties, you know, in the, very much in the language of, of Christian fundamentalism. Uh, you know, the, the president you know, comes before Congress and talks about God not being indifferent to freedom and fear. As an atheist, I hear that exactly the way I would hear someone saying, Zeus is not indifferent to freedom and fear. I mean, it is a, an uncannily strange and empty utterance. Um, and yet, uh, our culture is, is, is now programmed not to notice how strange and empty it is, and, and it does really significant work. And so we see things like stem cell research and um, uh, other uh, uh, causes that, that upon which the, the lives and, and, and happiness of millions of people really turn uh, get subverted by religious thinking, explicitly religious thinking. Well, I spent a lot of time thinking about and exploring uh, spiritual experience and our, our contemplative traditions, mostly in an Eastern context, in Buddhism and Hinduism. But I've also read much of the contemplative literature of Christianity and Judaism and Islam. Um, so I've been interested in religion for at least 20 years and uh, interested in spiritual experience and, and have spent a lot of time practicing meditation and studying with various meditation masters in India and Nepal and spending months and weeks on, on retreat just practicing meditation, um, very much the way a, you know, a monastic would in, in, in the Buddhist tradition. Um, so I, I'm, the concerns of uh, religious people, the ethical and the, and the spiritual concerns of religious people are, are something that I, uh, I think I understand and I take very seriously. I mean, I, I take very seriously the possibility of experiencing the world the way Buddha and Jesus and other uh, famous patriarchs and matriarchs seem to have experienced the world. And I, I think we want to actualize that kind of experience. I mean, if it's possible to love your neighbor as yourself, I'm interested in learning how to do that. Um, I just don't think we have to believe anything on insufficient evidence in order to do that. Well, what astonishes me when I read the newspaper uh, or watch the news is how many problems are the direct result of what people believe about God. I mean, there, there are days when I open the New York Times where fully half of the stories are, in a way that's unacknowledged by the, 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 the paper, relate to people's religious convictions. Um, it's, I, mean, I, you know, I mentioned the Virginia Tech shooting. I mean, this was the, the role that religion played in providing a context for this shooting was never really discussed in the media. But I mean, we, we just hear that the mother happened to be you know, a devout Christian and schlepped her child from church to church in search of exorcism. Um, uh, I, I just see continually uh, our attention bound up in uh, uh, these competing ideas about God uh, at best, this is, this is often just a waste of time, but at worst, it is, just, it is manufacturing violence and, and unnecessary conflict uh, and misuses of our resources. And what's more, it is, it, it is very rare that we acknowledge, I mean, now we're beginning to acknowledge the role that Islam is playing in, in uh, uh, 
Muslim terrorism. Uh, but uh, even that has been very slow to come. I mean, it's, it has been obvious for many, many years, long before September 11th, that a certain style of, of uh, uh, Muslim infatuation was leading to this kind of uh, jihadi behavior. Um, we're, we, because of the respect we accord religious faith, we're very slow to, to acknowledge its, its causal role in, in conflict. Well, I think the biggest challenge as a matter of uh, discourse and, and debate, uh, and the, certainly the most frustrating challenge, is, is, is what comes from otherwise secular and even non-believing people who are just reluctant to admit how much mad work is being done because of religion in this world. I mean, they, they either can't believe that people really believe this stuff. You know, so when a suicide bomber blows himself up in, in a crowd of children, um, this secular type of person will imagine that wasn't religion. I mean, it was not, had, had nothing to do with a belief in paradise and 72 virgins. Who could believe that? I mean, this is, this is a, some kind of psychological aberration or it's a, it's a caused by economic desperation or our policies in the region. I mean, it's not a matter of metaphysical beliefs. Um, I think the, the jury is in on this. I mean, we know that, that people really do believe these things. They are telling us ad nauseum they believe these things. And I don't think there's any more powerful rhetorical device uh, for emphasis than blowing yourself up or, or, or flying a plane into a building. And these people are really willing to die uh, for what they uh, believe. And we know it's not a matter of, I mean, to speak specifically about the Muslim world for a moment, we know it's not a matter of economics and, and education because, you know, in this recent plot in in the UK, these are all doctors who are who are aspiring suicide bombers. I mean, how, you know, how much more education did these doctors need? One was a neurosurgeon. You know, you, you find me a neurosurgeon suicide bomber, and you tell me the problem is education and economics. It's it, it clearly isn't. And um, the the deeper problem, and I think a far more sinister problem, is that it is possible to be well educated, so well educated that you can be a neurosurgeon and still believe that you can get 72 virgins in paradise. And this is made possible by the fact that we have allowed a certain mode of thought, religion, to thrive in, 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 a, in a, uh, a cocoon of, of this, this sphere of protection from criticism. It is just taboo to criticize people's religious beliefs. Well, th this is a, um, a common criticism, the idea that the atheist is guilty of, of a literalist reading of Scripture, um, no better than the reading of fundamentalists. It's a very naive uh, way of approaching religion, and there's a far more sophisticated and nuanced view of religion um, on offer, and the atheist is disregarding that. Um, a few problems with this. First is, anyone making that argument is... is uh, failing to acknowledge just how many people really do approach these texts literally or functionally. I mean, whether they're selective literalists or literal, all the way down the line, there is a th there are certain passages in these in scripture that just cannot be read figuratively, um, and uh, people really do live by the lights of what is literally laid out in these books. So, you know, the Quran says hate the infidel and Muslims hate the infidel because the Quran spells it out ad nauseum. Um, now, uh, it's true that you can cherry pick scripture and you can look for all the good parts. You can ignore where it says in Leviticus that if a a woman is not a virgin on her wedding night. You're supposed to stone her to death on her father's doorstep. You can ignore that. And, and now, to my knowledge, all Jews and Christians uh, do ignore that. In fact, that's not true. There are some Christians who actually do, you know, Reconstructionist Christians, Dominionist Christians in the U.S. who will say, yeah, no, I think the, the penalty for adultery should be death. I mean, so there are, there are people who are, have the courage of their convictions there. Um, but most of us, most religious people ignore those passages, which really can only be read literally, um, and say that, oh, they were only appropriate for the time, and they don't, don't apply now. And uh, likewise, Muslims try to have the same reading of passages that advocate holy war. They say, well, these were appropriate to those battles that Muhammad was fighting, but now we don't have to fight those battles. Um, 
this is all a, a good thing, but we should recognize what is, uh, what's, it, what's happening here. People are feeling pressure from a host of, of all too human concerns that have nothing in principle to do with God. I mean, secularism and human rights and democracy and scientific progress, these have, have made certain passages in Scripture untenable. Okay? So this is coming from outside religion. And religion is now making a great show of its sophistication in kind of grappling with these, with these pressures. Um, once again, this is, this is a, an example of religion losing the argument with modernity. It's an example of you know, the recent shooting at Virginia Tech. Uh, the, you know, the mother of, this, of the shooter uh, recognized that there was something wrong with her son. You know, he's suffering from some kind of mental problem. In the context of her uh, rather doctrinaire Christianity, she did not take him to a psychiatrist. She took him from church to church in search of exorcism. She actually found a church that performed an exorcism. So there were, there were, just picture this. There's some, uh, you know, we have a, a, uh, an atrocity in the making. Uh, we have a, a dangerously mental ill college student. We have a concerned mother whose worldview about mental health is trimmed down through the, the, the uh, keyhole of, of uh, a kind of medieval Christianity. Uh, and we have a church willing to put forward its expertise in the performance of an exorcism. Um, it would be a lot better if everyone involved had a 21st century view of mental health. Um, no one is, moderate people, moderate Christians and Jews and Muslims have to look at this situation uh, and say, well, there's something wrong here. It'd be better to go to a psychiatrist. Um, but the problem is you can't show what's wrong in terms of scripture. You can't show what's wrong in terms of, of religion because in terms of religion, the, the mother was right. I mean, there, is, there are demons and Jesus cast them out. You know, I mean, it's, it's, demonic possession is actually a problem. Um, the only reason why we're, we, we're, we don't take it seriously is because we have a wider view of, of the universe. The universe, that view of the universe did not come to us from religion, it came from science. Let's just grant the possibility that there, there is a creator God who's omniscient, who occasionally authors books. Uh, and he's going to give us a book, uh, the most useful book. He's a loving God, he's a compassionate God, um, and he's going to give us a guide to life. Uh, he's got a scribe, the scribe's going to write it down. What's going to be in that book? I mean, just think of how good a book would be if it were authored by an omniscient deity. I mean, th there is not a single line in the Bible or the Quran that could not have been authored by a, a, a first century uh, person. I mean, there's not, there's not one, one reference to anything. There's a, there, are, there, there are pages and pages about how to sacrifice animals and keep slaves and who to kill and why. Um, there's nothing about uh, electricity. There's nothing about DNA. There's nothing about how do, infectious disease, the principles of infectious disease. Um, there, there's, there's nothing particularly useful, and there's a lot of uh, Iron Age barbarism in there and superstition. Uh, this does not, I mean, this is not a candidate book. I mean, I can go into a, to, to any Barnes and Noble blindfolded and pull a book off a shelf which is going to have more relevance, uh, more wisdom uh, for the 21st century than the Bible or the Quran. I mean, it's, re it's really not an exaggeration. It's, it's, it, the, every one of our specific sciences has superseded and surpassed the wisdom of Scripture. From, from cosmology to psychology to economics, we know more about ourselves uh, than anyone writing the Bible or the Quran did. And that is a, a distinctly inconvenient fact for, the, the, for anyone w wanting to believe that this book was, was uh, dictated by the, the creator of the universe. Well, the, the, there are many problems with this idea that, I mean, first of all, that, that's an unfalsifiable Thesis. I mean, and there are infinite numbers of unfalsifiable theses that you're not tempted to believe. And we could believe that this is, we're in the matrix and, you know, I mean, that, that, you go down that 
uh, path and there's uh, a lot that could be asserted by people who are sure we're in the matrix and where you know some alien civilization is simulating us on a, their hard drive. Um, uh, one problem is that we have many holy books authored by the creator of the universe and they're in conflict. You know, they're not... It, the New Testament makes it perfectly clear that Jesus is the Son of God, really the Son of God, and you have to believe this, otherwise you're going to spend eternity in hell. The Quran says twice that Jesus was not the Son of God, and anyone who believes he's the Son of God will spend eternity in hell. I mean, this, is, this offers as much room for compromise as a coin toss. Uh, so so let's, say, let's say we just knew that one of those claims were, was right. You know, we have a universe, we, now it's, we've, we've, we've eliminated all the other possibilities. We're living in this challenging universe where God has given us a highly imperfect book and, and asked us to grapple with it. But now we have the biblical claim, the New Testament claim to the divinity of Jesus and, and it, the, the necessity of believing in it, and the Quranic claim that belief in Jesus' divinity leads to damnation. You know, which is more likely, that, that one of those is right uh, and the other is wrong, or that we have these competing tribes who were, who were toiling in the context of just abysmal ignorance about the, the world and, and the, you know, the, the, the birth of the cosmos and the, and the destiny of any individual soul after death. Uh, you know, I would put my lot in with a wider view of the circumstance, but even if we granted your premise that, no, no, there's a good reason to believe that one of these books is perfect, we're still with a, a coin toss situation. We don't know whether to be a Christian or a Muslim. Um, and we're noticing that people are, are choosing basically on, on the basis of accidents of birth. I mean, you're just accidentally born in Afghanistan, and then you, you choose to be a Muslim. Um, and likewise with Christianity elsewhere, uh, it is a, it's a very strange sort of loving God who would have created this circumstance. That by mere accident of birth, you are raised to believe that a certain book was, was uh, and, and let's say rightly raised to believe that this book was you know, the perfect book. But if you happen to be born in China, you, know, you go for centuries without hearing about this. It's a, it's a, a stray, a, for, for I think obvious reasons, a totally provincial and, and uh, implausible scenario. And yet it's the scenario that most people believe in the 21st century. Well, I do have existential worries. I mean, I, I'm, I like, I think, everybody else, uh, am concerned about death. You know, it's, it's, you know, death is in some ways unacceptable. I mean, it's, it's just an astonishing fact of our being here that we, that we die. But I think worse than that is that if we, if we live long enough, we lose everyone we love in this world. I mean, do people die and disappear, and we are, we are left with this stark mystery? Uh, there's just the sheer not knowing of what happened to them. And into this void, religion comes rushing with a very consoling story saying, nothing happened to them, they're in a better place and you're going to meet up with them after you die. You're going to get everything you want after you die, death is an illusion. Um, there's no question that that, if you could believe it, that would pay emotional dividends. I mean, there's, not, there's no other story you can tell somebody who's just lost her daughter to cancer, say, to make her feel good. You know, it, it, you know it, is, it is consoling to believe that the daughter was just taken up with Jesus and everyone's going to be reunited in a few short years. Um, there's no replacement for that. There doesn't need to be a replacement for that. I think we have to, be, we have to just witness the cost of that. I mean, there are many obvious costs of that way of thinking. Um, one is we just don't teach people how to grieve. You know, I mean, religion is the, kind of the antithesis of teaching your children how to grieve. You, you tell your child that, that you know, grandma's in heaven uh, and there's nothing to be sad about. Um, that's religion. It would be better to, to equip your child for the reality of this life, which is, you know, we, death, is, death is a fact and we don't know what happens after death. And I'm not pretending to know that you get a dial tone after death. I don't know what happens after uh, the, the physical brain dies. I don't know what the relationship between consciousness and the physical world is. Um, I don't think anyone does know. Now, I think there, there are many reasons to be doubtful of naive conceptions about the soul and about this idea that you could just migrate to a, a better place after death. But uh, I simply don't know about what, uh, I don't know what I believe about 
death. Um, and I don't think it's necessary to know in order to live uh, as sanely and ethically and happily as possible. I don't think you get, um, you don't get anything worth getting by pretending to know things you don't know. Yeah, well, I think that there's this myth that unless you think one of your books was dictated by the creator of the universe and, and there he told you what good, what good and evil are, you'll just have no basis for morality. I mean, you, you, you need religion in some sense to have a, a generalizable morality. Without religion, there's no way to say the Nazis were really wrong to, to do what they did or believe what they believed. Um, I think that's clearly untrue. I think we have a, uh, some very serviceable intuitions about, about what good and evil are and what, is, um, what constitutes an ethical life. And we converge on those intuitions. I mean, every culture uh, agrees that, that cruelty is wrong, you know, that taking pleasure in the suffering of others is wrong within the context of your in-group. I mean, the, the, many cultures think it's good to take pleasure in the, in the suffering of, of, of people who are not part of your tribe. Um, but in terms of, you know, who you're going to uh, admit into your moral sphere, we have some very serviceable intuitions about how we treat the people we accept in our sphere. And the challenge for modernity, the challenge for civilization, is to, to extend the sphere of our moral community to include the entire species and even other species so that we really, we really don't have these, these us and them boundaries uh, that we have. And our us and them boundaries are are really propped up by dogmatism. I mean, they're propped up by nationalism, they're tr propped up by racism, and there's many ways to divide your world uh, dogmatically. But the most insidious us and them boundary, f from my point of view, is religion. I mean, it really is, it, religion posits a, a transcendental object between you and this other person. I mean, not only are you different because of your skin color or your political persuasion or because you speak a different language, you are different for all time. For what you believe about God and what He believes about God are so opposed uh, that that and it, it's going to require eternity to you know an eternity of, of punishment in His case to work out that difference. Um, so I think it's a very uh, I think our more you know this question of morality is, is an important one to to focus on because many people are attached to religion not because they're convinced that, that the, the metaphysics make sense, but because they, they just see no other alternative to um, teaching kids you know, right and wrong. I think there's uh, a few obvious things to point out. One is that you, we, we clearly don't get our morality out of our holy books, because when you go into the holy books, they are bursting with cruelty. I mean, the, the Old Testament, the New Testament, uh, the Quran, these are... Uh, Profoundly cruel and morally ambiguous books, at best. I mean, the you know the Ten Commandments, uh, the first four commandments have nothing to do with morality. They have to do with with theological offenses. You know, don't take any other gods before me. Don't take God's name in vain. No graven images, etc. Don't work on the Sabbath. What are you supposed to do when people break those commandments? You're supposed to kill them. I mean, this is unbelievably immoral. Uh, and yet, and we're not doing that now, not because. The, the book itself is so wise. I mean, to take a, a, a more relevant example, slavery. I mean, slavery is clearly endorsed in the Bible. It's endorsed in the Old Testament. It's endorsed in the New Testament. We all agree that slavery is wrong. We, we conquered that ground morally through some very hard-fought conversations and also wars. Um, religion was a very little help in that. I mean, it, there were... It's, it's true that abolitionists were cherry-picking scripture, trying to find ways to, to justify their project. But their project wasn't coming from scripture because scripture is clear. It supports slavery. There was, there's, the evil of slavery is not recognized in the Bible, and it is, it is certainly not repudiated in the Bible. Um, and so the, the, the slaveholders of the South were on the winning side of that theological argument, and, and it... it Religion was an impediment to making that that moral progress. Um, again, the fact, even if it were not an impediment, even if it were extremely useful, 
that would not be a reason to believe that any of our books were dictated by an omniscient being. I'm not making any strong claims about where science is going. I think it's, it's, it's certainly reasonable to expect that we will understand our experience uh, much better than we do at the level of the brain. And there may, there may be some real impediments to that, but um, it could also be true that the sky is the limit. I mean, we could really understand it uh, in a very precise way, in such a way as to, to allow us to, to alter our experience in, in, um, in as fine a grain a way as we want. Who knows what, what awaits us there? But I know we're not going to get there if we uh, don't have an honest conversation about the roots of human experience. Uh, this whole idea of secular fundamentalism or atheist dogmatism, and this is really a, a play on words. There's, there's nothing that you have to accept uh, as dogma. There's nothing you have to accept on insufficient evidence in order to reject the biblical God or in order to reject the idea that the Quran or the Bible is, is, is the perfect word of God. Um, there's no dogma that you and I have accepted on insufficient evidence in order to reject Zeus and Poseidon and the thousands of dead gods that lie buried in that, in that mass grave we call mythology. I mean, these, are, these, are, these gods were in good standing among generations of our ancestors. And for a variety of historical reasons, mostly the ascent of, of monotheism, they are now in disrepute. But they have the same epistemological stature as the god of Abraham. I mean, this is not like, it's not like there's so much data for the God of Abraham and there's no data for Poseidon. They're both without data. Um, and it's an accident of history that we are not worshiping Poseidon and, and trying to constrain our, um, you know, maritime law, uh, uh, you know, in deference to the whims of the, you know, the God of the ocean. There may be, a, there's a value in storytelling. There's a value in, in certainly in art and literature, and, and I think there's a, specifically a value in, in narrative, and um, there may be a value in kind of taking on certain mythical propositions as though they, as, as kind of a schema through which to look at your life. I mean, to, to you know, take Joseph Campbell's story of the, you know, the hero's journey and to think of yourself in those terms and just to look at what, uh, features of your your life and psychology that springs into view, um, but I think we have to be very careful ab about making claims to knowledge about the world. I mean, you take something like you know tarot card reading. You know, someone you know, puts the cards down in front of you, uh, and they you know they t turn up you know, whatever it is, the three of rods, or whatever what a tarot card is, and. They say, well, this, you know, this suggests to me that um, you're dealing with issues of honesty. Uh, and uh, have you been dishonest with anyone in your life? Um, now, there are two ways to approach a situation. I, I, you know, I think tarot card reading is totally bogus as a metaphysical instrument. I don't think the, the card is, is, is doing anything important there, except it is causing you to ask a question about your life. I mean, somebody is just point blank. A moment ago, you weren't thinking about honesty. And now I've just put this card in front of you and said, well, this tells me that you, know, you might want to ask yourself this question. All of a sudden, that, may, you know, that changes your, your experience in the present moment. And it may, in fact, get you to realize that, oh, yeah, you know, I have some real work to do with my wife or my father. Or, um, but the question is then, what do you, let's say you have that experience of a really valuable tarot card reading. You know, what are you going to conclude about tarot cards on the, uh, on the basis of that? I think you'd be wrong to conclude that this is magic. You'd be right to conclude that there's a certain value in asking questions um, and, and that it's very easy, we know this, it's very easy to, to set up a system which has a, a psychological resonance for most people most of the time. This is why astrology seems to work for most people most of the time. You can give Charles Manson's astrological chart to 100 people and 99 of them will say, yeah, well, there's, you know, they'll think it's their chart, and they think, yeah, this really does kind of get me uh, in some fundamental way. Uh, because there's no magic to this. Things are written with, you know, sufficient generality as to be evocative uh, uh, for everybody, because we're very similar. Well, I mean, it's... It's an elusive thing to uh, 
uh, get a hold of. I, th I think the, the absence of neurosis, the absence of fear, the absence of anxiety, uh, when you recognize what consciousness is like when those states of mind have subsided, uh, it, it seems to me intrinsically happy. It's intrinsically at ease. It's, it's intrinsically peaceful and, um, I mean, at times even blissful. I mean, it's just it's the, the lack of complication, just merely being aware of oneself uh, in the present moment and not... Um, uh, continually being in conversation with, with, with oneself about the present moment, I mean, just thinking, 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 you know, incessantly, when that can subside, either because you're meditating or because you're enjoying yourself so much in, you know, in sport or, you know, you're having sex. I mean, any peak experience has this feature of, of having your attention really uh, uh, um, focused in, in a very uncomplicated way uh, on your experience in the present. And so that, that state of mind is, is uh, what I would call happiness. And, and all of the obstacles to being at rest in that, in that state of mind, I, I would I think of as the obstacles to happiness. And those are things like, you know, a neurotic self-absorption with how other people perceive you or, you know, anxiety about the future or regret about the thing you didn't say, uh, you know, yesterday. I mean, all of those, those are the, way, those are the modes of thought that keep us from recognizing that it's possible to actually be really at ease in the present and, and happy with, with happy before anything happens. I mean, our, they have to have a happiness that's not contingent upon the next good thing that's going to happen, but have just to actually be at rest with what is happening right now. Certainty is, is I think, a false goal. I mean, we're not achieving, we're, we're achieving functional certainties in science and in just the, in our in our day-to-day -day lives. I mean, it's a functional certainty that I'm sitting here talking to you, though it's possible I could be dreaming or, you know, deceived by an evil demon. Um, I mean, those kinds of phil philosophical, epistemological worries don't really relate too much to the ordinary practice of science, the very useful practice of science, and our ordinary... Um, task of just negotiating our lives and finding happiness in this world. Uh, we recognize that there's a, a range, there's a continuum of, you know, I'm not sure, you know, it's a coin toss, 50-50 uh, uh, understanding of a circumstance to being functionally certain uh, about what is so. And many people are pretending to be functionally certain or believe themselves to be functionally certain about things like Jesus is going to come back and judge the world in their lifetime. I mean, 20% of the American population claims to be functionally certain that that is going to come to pass, and 78% think that Jesus is going to come back sometime, not necessarily in their lifetime. Uh, and these certainties do real work for us. I mean, the, the, the person who's certain that uh, the soul enters the zygote at the moment of conception is the person who wants to veto stem cell research, uh, despite the fact that tens of millions of people are suffering conditions which, for which stem cell research is the best line of research to generate therapies. So these, these are ideas that are not just of academic interest or personal, private, spiritual relevance. I mean, these are, these are shaping policy. They're shaping a national conversation. And then when you look to the Muslim world, they are causing people to blow themselves up on street corners. Well, I think we are misled by this, this very term, religion. We use this word religion as though it named a distinct thing, as, as though it named one uh, phenomenon in, in human discourse. And there's really a range of, of infatuations and practices that go by the name of religion. And, and therefore, many points on this continuum don't have much in common with, with others. So if you take a religion like Jainism, you know, religion of India, its core principle is nonviolence. I mean, this is where Gandhi got his conception of nonviolence. Um, the Jains are vegetarian. They, they have no doctrine of holy war. In fact, they don't even have a doctrine, uh, a proper doctrine of self-defense. I mean, they're, they're pacifists. They don't want to hurt uh, a fly. Um, and then you, on the other end of the continuum, you have something like Islam, where it has explicitly a doctrine of holy war. 
and a notion of, of cert, you know, combat and death in certain contexts uh, is, is actually the highest obligation a, a religious person can, can fulfill. So these are both religions. You know, this is, so religion is a word like sport. You know, you have a sport like badminton and you have a sport like, you know, uh, boxing. They're not, they're both sports that, you know, they're, one is much more dangerous. Um, so I'm, I'm concerned, I'm obviously more concerned about religions like Islam that wherein you have this marriage of um, uh, a variety of spiritual and ethical concerns, but also uh, certain kinds of metaphysical certainties that inspire people to not only die, but to kill others in the process. Um, and you don't have that in other religions. So I, I think we have to be clear about how this term religion uh, can, can mislead us. I, I view religions as essentially failed sciences. I mean, the, the religion, religion was the discourse uh, that we had when all causes in the universe were opaque. We didn't know, we didn't know the basis of anything. We didn't know why we were here. We, we didn't know how diseases spread or what disease was. We didn't know how people, uh, why people died early and why others flourished. We don't know what, what's causing you know, thunderstorms or co causing crops to fail. Uh, and we very naturally, as a, as a, a cognitive and behavioral imperative, we, we form uh, descriptions of the world and we try to figure out what's going on. Um, we tell ourselves stories about our origins and about where we're going and about causes in the world. And those stories, given, given our just pervasive ignorance and our, our disposition to see agency in the world, to see, you know, uh, to feel ourselves in relationship to the world, these stories entail being in relation to invisible friends, you know, and enemies. And we, so we have, you know, th this parent figure in the sky who's going to take care of things if you live uh, rightly, and, and we have other demonic presences that we should be really worried about. And gradually, uh, what, what you see happening is that religion, as, 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 rationality and, and dozens of specific sciences were birthed in the human conversation, you see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument with science. I mean, we see that, you know, on the front of, of human health and disease, religion, you know, it used to be that you could get a diagnosis of demonic possession. I mean, you, that was, a, you know, a reasonable thing to believe you had if you were having seizures, say, you know, but now we have a science of neurology and we know about epilepsy. And so when your kid has seizures, you know, you don't go to the church to get get him diagnosed and treated b b by exorcism. And so that's a good thing. I'm saying that religion is losing the argument on every other front. It's losing the argument ethically. It's, it's gonna, it will lose the argument spiritually. I mean, we will understand spiritual experience so well at some point, at, at the level of the brain and at the level of uh, the way in which using attention in certain ways can change human experience. We'll understand it in a way that makes a mockery of this kind of de denominational religion talk about Jesus and grace or about Buddha and magic powers. And, and, and that will break down in the same way that it has broken down on medicine, on the, in medicine. And that's, that's a process I think we just have to be honest about and, and let unfold. Well, I can't say that I'm an optimist. I, mean, I, you know, it's, I see that uh, this our emotional attachment to these myths is so well subscribed and so deep. Um, and the belief, even people who are not religious, believe that everyone else needs to be religious. I mean, it's like, you know, I don't, I don't need it, but I mean, it's like the ultimate condescending attitude, but everyone else does. I mean, this is a, a myth that, that is also widely subscribed, even among atheists. Um, so the, the inertia in the system around, around really just having an honest conversation about what uh, it's reasonable to believe and what religion is doing in the world uh, is profound. And so I'm, I, I'm certainly not optimistic, um, but I don't know what else to do. And, and, and I see how, how tissue thin these, these beliefs actually are. I mean, they really are. It, it would be so easy to just unburden ourselves of all of this mythology. I mean, it, you know, it, it would be accomplished in a single generation if we just taught our children reasonably about the Bible's place in literature. You know, the Bible is not science. 
Uh, and it's not particularly good philosophy, but it is literature. Let's, let's, let's read the Bible, and then let's read all these other books about dead gods, like the, you know, Ovid's Metamorphoses. Um, if we taught the Bible